today we are continuing our holiday Mia Mini Via Mia Via <laughs> Mini Via called Oxni, in which we celebrate the season of Advent, Hanukkah, Solstice, Christmas, New Year's, and Epiphany. And our theme for this Mini Via is ordinary miracles. We are just celebrating the ways that we encounter miracles in all of the seemingly mundane and ordinary times of our lives. It was writer and shame expert, Brene Brown, who wrote, a joyful life is made up of joyful moments gracefully strung together by trust, gratitude, inspiration, and faith. So as we enter this third week of Advent, our theme for the week is joy. And we may think of joy as some form of eternal feeling of happiness, but as Brown points out, Joy is closely related to those other things that make us feel happy and safe in the world. Trust, gratitude, inspiration, and faith. So today we're going to explore one of those components of joy, which is the ordinary miracle of trust. Honestly, it's a miracle that anybody trusts anybody these days, right? <laughs> Our world has become so polarized with everyone picking and choosing sides and then demonizing those who don't think rightly or believe rightly or speak rightly or vote rightly. It was Rodney King back in 1992 who famously asked, can't we all just get along? And the answer apparently has been a resounding no. <laughs> we just can't get along. The holy though, the holy calls us to experience the joy of trust, especially trust in one another. Now, the ego tells us that we can't trust anybody because egos are not trustworthy. They really are not. They're very capricious. They're never to be trusted because they're always out to win at all costs. The trust that we are called to invest <coughs> is the trust in ourselves' jubilance, the trust in our own innocence, the inherent goodness of ourselves. And when we can trust the inherent goodness of ourselves, then we begin to see the inherent goodness in everyone. And that, that, the innocence of those around us, is worthy of our trust. Many of them may be playing this outward role of villain quite well in the world, but that's not who they truly are. It's not who any of us truly are. None of us are our worst actions or decisions that we have ever made. What we are at our true core is joy. What we are at our core is love. What we are at our core is peace. We are all God's light shining in this dark, illusory world. Some lights are dimmed by more layers of ego than others, but our joy is found in seeing even the tiniest glimmer of innocence within others because we have seen it in ourselves. And when we can live in that state of joyous trust jubilance, that's when we get to say, oh, oh yeah. yeah. When somebody says these two little words to you, trust me, your reaction will depend on a number of factors, <coughs> not the least of which will be what profession that person is in. According to a Gallup survey a few years ago, the people we tend to trust the most are nurses, doctors, Engineers, police officers, I know, <laughs> college professors, and even <clears throat> members of the clergy. <laughs> but maybe not in here, I don't know. <laughs> Among those we trust the least, anybody want to guess? Oh, you get lawyers. Car salesmen, there you go. Lawyers. Lawyers. Real estate. <laughs> Politicians, members of Congress, personal, developers. So bankers, lawyers, <coughs> insurance salespeople, insurance. HMO managers, and members of Congress. Indeed, the only people we trust less than our Congress critters are car salespeople. Yes. <laughs> Always trying to sell you something, right? It's interesting to note that the most trusted professions are populated with people who are not just professionals, but they are experts in their field, you know, nurses and doctors and college professors, clergy. <laughs> <laughs> We're also very humble. <laughs> 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 
we find them trustworthy because they worked hard to get where they are. And we don't usually have their expertise or often the desire to prove them wrong, unless, you know, we're talking about COVID. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> let's not go there. Those other folks at the bottom of the list, though, we feel like they're no more expert than, than what we do, you know, than what we think we know. We could research the best car or insurance to buy or which bank to use. The most recent survey, though, shows a declining trust in our governmental institutions, with 55% saying they trust Americans to make their own choices over those that elected officials make for us. Now, we could educate ourselves in how the governmental system is supposed to work, where we, edu where we, where we actually elect people that, that represent our concerns. Again, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. But anyway, <laughs> our money says, in God we trust. But I'm not even sure that's true anymore, because whose God should we be trusting? Are we trusting the vending machine God of the prosperity gospel preachers that promise that if we insert enough prayers, we get all the heavenly goodies, or the earthly goodies we want? Should we trust the insurance salesman God who promises that if we say or do the right things, according to whichever religion we might be following, we'll go to a heaven that's got streets of gold or 72 virgins. I mean, which God? Should we trust the Savior God that swoops in at the last minutes and, and saves the elect and annihilates the damned? Or maybe we just trust the God we've made in our own image because that God hates all the same people we do. <laughs> which one? <laughs> Jerry Useem, writing in Atlantic Magazine last month, says that we are in the middle of a trust recession that has been created by a lot of factors, including the prevalence of remote work that has damaged trust, not just between employees and their bosses, but between colleagues themselves who can no longer stop by the water cooler and commiserate in the break room. Useem says it's difficult to regain the trust that we have lost, and our civilization becomes more and more imperiled the worse it gets. Trust, it seems, is a lost art, and one where we tend to hedge our bets. I mean, I remember President Reagan, the motto was, trust, but verify, which doesn't seem like trust at all. <laughs> but it was the Christian church father, Augustine, who advised, pray as though everything depended on God, work as though everything depended on you. And this is how we live most of our lives wishing we could just really put our faith in something. But we soon discover that everything we trust eventually crumbles under the weight of our expectations. We're nothing special in our day or in time, though, even though we think we are. Every generation before us and everyone that hopefully comes after us will all struggle with the issue of trust. In Jesus' day, the people didn't know who to trust, so they often put their trust in wandering evangelists like John, who, as today's Jesus story says, lived out in the wilderness, clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt tied around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. Sounds like one of those crunchy granola hippie guru types that would <laughs> pop up in the 60s, right? John, though, he knew a thing or two about trust, and he wasn't about to tell his followers that he knew it all. No, in this passage, we find him telling those around him that while he can teach them the highest form of thought here in this world of illusion that he knows about, there's someone else coming who can teach them the highest form of living of them all, how to become and embody that higher divine self in the world. I can only baptize you with water, John says. He admits that his power is limited in this physical world of illusion. That Jesus guy, though, he's on his way, and he's the one will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And this is what trust is about, jubilance. You want to regain trust? Stop looking outside of you to trust anything. Start looking deeper within where the Holy Spirit wants to immerse you in the cleansing waters of your higher divine self. And when you have experienced that kind of baptism, you will always, no matter what is going on in this world around you, you will always walk unafraid. Breathe deep. Up until the age of 10, I lived what you would call a fairly normal, boring, middle-class life. 
My father was a Southern Baptist preacher, and he had this steady stream of jobs for some reason <laughs> that kept us moving a lot, but it also kept us well-housed and clothed. My stay-at-home mom kept us well-fed and loved and disciplined, and that all ended when they divorced. My mother found, out, found that even in the 1970s, a job at McDonald's wasn't enough to pay your average mortgage, and so we lost the house. We had to move into the federal housing projects across town. And this is when I learned that a world of abundance can turn on a dime into a world of lack and want. In fact, we wanted for a lot of things in the projects, but we never, ever, ever went without anything we actually needed. Even today, when I wonder <coughs> if I will have all that I need, I remember those times in public housing, and I realized, that God has never left me bereft. I have never lacked for anything that I needed. You always want a lot of stuff because you got an ego, right? <laughs> you always want things. But I never went without what was needed. And my mom always seemed to have this kind of knowing that even in our darkest days, when the pantry was getting bare, we were down to our last few ounces of powdered milk, she always trusted something would break our way. And you know what? It always did. Whether it came in the form of the church food pantry and a neighbor, an unexpected windfall, something, something always came to ensure that our needs were met. Now, that kind of childhood doesn't leave you without some serious psychic scars. I mean, I had to work very hard over the years to overcome this overwhelming feeling of lack that that kind of living fostered, because while there was always enough that you needed, there was always just barely enough. And over the years, I've had to change my way of thinking about the universe's <coughs> sense of abundance. I've gone from thinking, well, there's barely enough, to there's enough. And then I realized I had enough, but just enough. And so I changed my mantra, there's always more than enough. And sure enough, there's always more than enough. What happened? Well, I did, as the author of Second Peter recommends for us to do. I repented, but I didn't repent of a sin. I repented in my belief that I couldn't trust the universe, that the realm of God within me and with every, within everyone does provide for everything we will ever need. I repented of the belief in lack. This is what repentance is about. It's not about groveling for forgiveness of some perceived sin in front of an angry God. No, repentance in Greek is metanoia, and it simply means to change your mind. I repented when I changed my mind about trusting in the holy to provide anything and everything I will need for my life. And when I did that, the old earth I inhabited that place where lack and barely enough was just as real as gravity and taxes and death, that old world dissolved. The more I trusted in the universe and the holy to bring me more than enough, even more into my life, I entered a new heaven and a new earth, a place where all your needs are met, not just monetary, but in other areas. In areas of love and joy and happiness and peace, there is more than enough on this new world. And the old world dissolves away. Writer Eckhart Tolle says that heaven is our higher consciousness and earth is where our heavenly focused mind manifests its love in the world. He writes, a new heaven is the emergence of a transformed state of human consciousness. I love that, a new heaven is the emergence of a transformed state of human consciousness and a new earth is its reflection in the physical realm. When you create that new world within, you create a new world without. Jubilance, if we stop seeking to be baptized with the illusory water of this world and instead consistently seek that inner baptism of the Holy Spirit, our trust in the Holy deepens every single day and we will eventually learn how to always walk unafraid. And my repentance from belief in a world of lack and need to a new heaven and new earth of abundance and joy, I did what A Course in Miracles says all teachers of God are called to do. 
the teachers of God, it says, have trust in the world. Because they have learned, it is not governed by the laws that the world made up. It is governed by a power that is in them, but not of them. It is this power that keeps all things safe. It is through this power that the teachers of God look on a forgiven world. In my repentance jubilance, I found I could trust this world because I finally could see through its illusions. The ego would have us believe that the world plays by its own rules. It's got rules. It's rules of greed. It's rules of accumulation of more than you will ever need in money or power or love or anything that the ego sees as valuable. Instead, though, a course tells us this world is truly governed by the Holy Spirit that dwells in, through, and around us at all times. This is the true power in the world, but not of it. It's a power that lives up, that invites us to live in that same way. As long as we are walking around in these bodily forms, we have to deal with all the minutiae of life. We've got to make a living. We've got to make a life. We've got to walk the dog. We've got to take out the trash. We've got to pay the bills. We're in this world, jubilance. But John the Baptist, the author of Second Peter, and of course tell us, we are not of this world. We are not made of the stuff of the ego. We are not made of small pettiness that judges itself by comparing itself to everyone else in the world. We are born for something greater. We all are. Our only purpose here is to learn how to trust that baptism of the Holy Spirit within ourselves and then spill that love and grace out into the world in the form of love and compassion and joy and mercy and peace. When we live in the ego, of course, says, we fly with the wings of sparrows. Have you ever seen sparrows fly? They flit. <laughs> they go here, and then they go there, and then they go. They're never happy. They just go from one branch to another, next power line to the other. And that's what we do. That's our ego. It flits back and forth, thinking we're lower than dirt, thinking we're higher than the angels. <laughs> somewhere in the middle, <coughs> looking around. But when you have experienced that new heaven, and that new earth, and you only trust in that higher divine self, then you give up the sparrow's wings. <coughs> you stop flitting around. Instead, you notice you have the wings of eagles. Eagles do not flit. <laughs> eagles soar. And those are the wings that help us soar above the pettiness of the ego, to soar above the problems our ego keeps trying to convince us that we have, to soar above the temptation to put our trust in anything outside of ourselves. Now, if you can fully trust that the universe has your back, that you will never be left without anything that you need, then you can walk through this world unafraid and soar with the wings of eagles because you have touched that inner divinity. You have experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit that has cleansed you of, of the ego's grip on your life. Now, until we learn to use those eagle's wings like enlightened masters, we may need to be baptized with that Holy Spirit more than once. <laughs> Indeed, we may need daily or hourly baptisms, but as a Course says, the more we try out those eagle's wings, the less willing we will ever be again to flit like a sparrow and trust the ego's petty strength. So jubilance, our purpose here is to sail on those eagle's wings and show others that we all have the power to put our ultimate trust, not in things of this world, but in that new heaven, in that new earth, where the holy within us creates the holy around us. While we still may not trust the politicians or the car salesmen, we must always be willing to see them, even them, as holy and innocent children of God just like we are because we are all one. If we can see their innocence, even through the villain role that they're playing very well in this world, <laughs> If we can remember it's a role. It's what they're doing. They're, just do, they're, they're learning their lessons, and this is how they do it. But the moment we can see the innocence, the child in them, 
Maybe look at your least favorite politician as a five-year-old, just fumbling around. They don't know what they're doing, but they're innocent. And when we see that, we can love them, even as we work to prevent or undo some of their bad ideas and policies. When we can see the truth about them, that they are all holy and innocent, then we can see that holiness and innocence of ourselves. And then we begin to respond from a deeper place of love and compassion whenever we are feeling that they are acting in untrustworthy ways. In jubilance, this is how we save the world. We put our trust in that inner baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we walk unafraid, even if we stumble now and then. A course tells us that the gifts of God are always laid out before us. A new heaven and a new earth await. It's right there for you to step into. And if we know that, why would we ever again flit around with our sparrow wings and put our trust in the shabby offerings of the ego? Jubilance, you were born to soar. Trust me.